Greetings, everyone, all around the world, all over the United States, from Florida to Washington State, and from up in New York, clear down into California, and all over the world, Australia, South Africa, wherever you are watching this, a special Bible study from my own study here near Tyler, Texas, on the 28th day of March, just before the Days of Unleavened Bread of 2001. And a special greetings to all of you people in Australia and to Doosan that I understand is going to travel about 800 miles one way just to get up to be with brethren around the Sydney area for the Days of Unleavened Bread. That's dedication. We all know, or we wouldn't be attending the Days of Unleavened Bread, what it's all about, but year by year, I am commanded to proclaim the meaning of God's annual holy days in their seasons. So have your Bibles ready and turn to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And while you're turning there, let me remind you that the world we came out of, I say we, I was reared by my father, as you well know, from a tiny boy, not to observe Christmas, Easter, and Halloween and all of that. But when I say we came out of the world, I was certainly very much part of the world in my early years and certainly in the Navy and participated with them in everything they did. It doesn't seem a bit strange to people at the time that they call Christ Mass or the Mass of Christ, which the Protestants swallow whole from the Roman Catholic Church. And what do they do at Christmas? It features a Christmas dinner. Not only does it feature all the bulbs and orbs, the little tree, which has, as we know, mythological origins about Semiramis and Nimrod and about little Wolfred, who was about to be sacrificed under the so-called sacred oak of Jupiter, and the story of St. Boniface, as he was called, who rescued the young lad and then came up with a story after cutting down the oak that a little evergreen had sprung up overnight, and all of the symbolism that the Catholics and the Protestants later adapted over totally pagan mythology and tried to say that the little evergreen is Jesus Christ. Well, you know all about all the accoutrements of Christmas and Easter and all of that. But no one thinks it strange that they sit down to a Christmas goose. Now, in the West, it's more the Christmas turkey. And the poor turkeys, if they knew along about December 1st what's going to happen to them, they'd probably all try to fly out of the pen. And we all know that people don't think it's strange at all to celebrate some kind of a festive occasion. One of the holidays of the so-called Western Christian professing world with dinners and with things to eat. But if you were to say, these are the days of unleavened bread, people look at you like you are crazy. They don't know what in the world you're talking about. Unleavened bread, they've never heard of it. Very few people have heard of it. And those few who have, always think it has to do with the Jews. They know that Jews eat things like matzos. They don't know why. They don't know what it means. And of course, even the Jews who eat it don't know what it means. But God's Word very clearly tells us what it means, and the typology is impossible to ignore. Beginning to read in the first verse of Leviticus 23, the Eternal spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord. Capital letters L-O-R-D, as I've explained time and again in the King James English Bible, really should read the Eternal, or the Ever-Living One. And it comes from J-H-V-H, or Y-H-V-H, which is God, Elohim, but Jehovah, as some people pronounce it, in covenant relationship with Israel. My father, years before I was born, decided to automatically, when he saw the word Lord there, it doesn't come from Baal. The word Baal is the Hebrew word for Lord. It comes from Y-H-V-H, which means the one who was, who is, and who will always be, the ever-living one. And so my father said, the eternal, and I followed that all of my life as well. Concerning the feasts of the Jews, which you shall proclaim, you caught that, did you? You know that the Protestant world thinks these are feasts of the Jews. Now, right here before your nose in a Bible, it says very clearly, these are the feasts of the Eternal, capital L-O-R-D, the ever-living one, God's feasts, God's festivals. His name is in them. He is the one who handed them down to Israel. Now, as my father explained for so many years, when you read that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, and that the Sabbath was made for man, and that's in Mark 2, 26 and 27. My father always put it this way. 
The Sabbath was made when man was made. And you're reading the first chapter of the book of Genesis and on through the second and third chapters about the creation week, about the creation of man, and that man was created on the sixth day and the seventh day God rested and God did not quit his creating. He merely quit his work and he created the seventh day Sabbath holy by resting during that period of time. So my father put it this way. The Sabbath was made. It is something which was created because when God set this earth in orbit around the sun and the moon in orbit around the earth and the earth revolving every 24 hours on its axis, he called the evening and the morning the first yom or the first day. So God is the creator of time. And time and space, time and distance are the same thing. We measure time or a day by the length of time it takes for the world to rotate once to have a nighttime, which is the true beginning of the day at sunset, and a daytime. And then by a man-made watch, man has decided to divide it up into 12 hours or 12 units of time during daylight and 12 units of time during nighttime. It doesn't work perfectly, of course, uh, anywhere except right at the equator, and even then not always because of the various seasons, but nevertheless that is an arbitrary thing that man has managed to do. Now God is the one who created the movement of the planets and the observations that we make of the solar system and therefore the lunar month and the solunar month, which are not exact, as you know, and the divisions of time. And as Christ himself said, hath not a day, 12 hours. So we know that the Hebrew word yom means the evening and the morning or the nighttime and the daytime, a 24-hour day. All right, the Sabbath was made because God designated the seventh evening and morning, yom, together, as holy, holy time, commencing in Palestine, where the Garden of Eden was located, not over in the Akkadian or Sumerian Valley, but probably right in the environs of modern-day Jerusalem, which tradition, and I think that that's probably correct, says was the location of the original Garden of Eden. But my father went on to say, the annual Sabbaths were made and were revealed when the church was made. Now, of course, we know that the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, the first annual holy days of the year, were revealed to Israel while they were in captivity, while they were in slavery in Egypt. So there is deep symbolism, not only in a paschal sacrifice reflecting Jesus Christ in his shed blood, but also in the fact that it was to be put on the doors and lintels of their little shanties in Egypt, and that when the death angel would see it, it would pass over them and omit them from the death list, which he was then effecting in Egypt and killing every firstborn, and so they were exempted. They were passed over. They were skipped on by. And it was the blood physically from the lamb that was put on the doorpost and the lintels that the death angel saw, which gave them immunity. The spiritual application of that is that when Jesus Christ's blood has been accepted by you and me, and we have gone through the rite of baptism, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the Holy Spirit of God, the death angel, figuratively, which is going to exact the penalty of death by Gehenna fire, passes over us. We have been exempted. We are no longer under the penalty of the law. And we have been forgiven for our past sins, and we have a great high priest who is there in heaven above. When we go to him, when we stumble and fail, he is there to listen to us as we pour out our hearts to him. And to turn to God the Father and to say, Father, I understand this person because I went through similar things. I know what these temptations and trials are like. Please forgive them. I won't go into a discussion of grace here at this point because I've discussed it frequently and in many, many sermons and it's in a lot of booklets you can read. But nevertheless, the condition of grace is God's mercy and his pardon, a part of the character of God. It is not a condition in which the repentant sinner dwells, which means he can go out and do anything he wants to from now on. And I think you all understand that. Now, getting back to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. These are the feasts of the eternal which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. And the word convocation means convoked. You've heard of the word provoked. Well, convoked means actually to order the feast or the festival or the meeting. It is an ordered occasion, a commanded assembly. It's not an invited assembly. 
It's not a casual assembly. It is a convoked or a commanded assembly. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Most people have never thought of the weekly Sabbath as being like a feast of God, one of God's feasts. It is lumped together with the annual holy days. Here in this chapter, the weekly Sabbath is not separate from the annual Sabbaths. They're all a part of the same package. It is the Sabbath of the eternal in all of your dwellings. These are the feasts of the eternal, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their season. So I have no leeway here. I have no recourse. I am not free to decide to pick out a sermon about love or faith or charity or good works or goals or something else on the first day of unleavened bread or the second day of unleavened bread. I'm not free to do so on the day of Pentecost or at the Feast of Trumpets or the Day of Atonement or on the Feast of Tabernacles. God's ministers are commanded to proclaim these convocations, and that obviously means to proclaim what they mean, to announce we need to gather together, come here and be there at a certain time, have this as a commanded assembly, and explain what it's all about. In the 14th day of the first month at even, and that's all explained in my book that on the Passover, it was at the going away or the going down of the sun is the eternal's Passover. And on the 15th day, just a few hours later, because beginning at noon and shortly after noon, which was the evening or the leveling of the sun. You and I have been raised in a world where we think evening is after sunset and sometime we call twilight, but before full dark. We say good evening instead of good afternoon. But it really comes from the word leveling, evening. And you can see in biblical history, and many of the Bible helps that are there, like kiddos, Bible Cyclopedia, and so on, that they could begin slaughtering that lamb any time from, say, noon to three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, having watched sheep be slaughtered, and having slaughtered many animals myself, deer, antelope, so on, I know what kind of preparation it takes. I know that when you slaughter a sheep, and then you hang it up, and then you strip the hide off, and you have to take the entrails out. You have to completely clean it. You wash it down and so on. Then you have to butcher it. And then you have to sear, uh, well, broil in this case, or they would barbecue like we would say today because they did it over an open fire and cook it. You don't do all of that in just one hour. You don't do that between sunset and full dark. They're just nowhere near enough time. So the sheep were slaughtered several hours earlier and the preparation of taking the hide and all of that off. Now in this case, they did roast it whole. They didn't do what I'm saying about that, but still they had to put it on a spit and they had to roast that animal and that takes a lot of time. Several hours turning slowly over an open barbecue to roast a mature sheep or in this case a lamb. So it was killed or slaughtered late in the afternoon, but by the time the dinner was prepared, it was after sunset and the beginning of the nighttime, which was the 15th. And the 15th is the feast day where the Passover lamb, which was to be slaughtered, was to be slaughtered late on the 14th of Abib, or the month of green ears. So it says, on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the eternal. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Simple command. No problem. Doesn't really deprive you of anything. The only thing you need to do is to have a different kind of bread. Instead of eating fluffed up bread that is puffed up as a result of the raising of temperature in dough, which causes various things like yeast or various leavening agents, even the little spores that float around in the air, but most people buy baking powder, baking soda, or they use like brewer's yeast or something, and they put it in their bread. Then it causes the formation of carbon dioxide bubbles and it makes it light and airy and a lot more palatable instead of being so hard that it hurts your foot if you drop it on it as you take it out of the oven. And it would be just like lead if you had a great big lump of dough about that big and you bake it hard, it'd be awfully hard to even get your teeth into it, as you well know. Maybe you never tried that. So, nevertheless, it was to be unleavened. And there is a very great reason for that. Because leavening puffs up. Leavening inflates. It swells up. We'll come to that in due course. But it does say seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Now, what we do in our family, of course, is go out and buy matzos and hardtack. I, my wife in, 
occasions in the past has made us unleavened bread that she makes herself, but mostly we will purchase it. But what I do is enjoy what I call norskas. Let me tell you how to make those right quickly. Flat pancakes, crepes you can call them. All I do is take the stone ground whole wheat flour, maybe the Romanian kind or the high altitude kind or whatever I happen to have, depending on where I am, take a cup or two of that and start adding tinned or canned milk. I'm gonna pass on my own private recipe here. And I just mix it until it's smooth and I just put as much in a bowl as I think I need for depending on how many people are there. I don't measure it by the cup or anything else. It just depends on whether the whole family's coming over or just my wife and me or one of our sons or whatever. And I will get a bowl about yay big and I will smooth it out and with the spoon, just with canned milk, much better than, than the uh, fresh milk that has a high water content, makes it much smoother and stir it and stir it and stir it until I get about the right consistency where it'll pour out of the spoon very easily and then it is, you know, free of all the lumps. And then if I need to, I can thin it down with a little bit of regular milk or even water later on if I want to get a more, a thinner consistency. And then what I do is take two, three or four eggs, again, depending upon the size of the bowl I want to make, let's say two eggs, and I crack the eggs and I very carefully separate them and let the whites get into a little dish and then I put the yellows in the batter and on the flour. And then as I'm mixing the batter, I may even add a tiny little bit of oil. Don't do it most of the time, but I can from time to time. I will add a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar. And then I will mix that until it's smooth and the right consistency and mix those yolks all in there. And then I will take the egg whites and I will Normally, if I'm making pancakes, I will beat them. This time, I don't. I'm, I'm messing this up. i got to go back and tell you, no, no, no. I'm telling you how to make pancakes. Forget separating the eggs. You don't beat the whites because even though that would technically not be a violation of the law because you're really not leavening anything, you are trying to put air bubbles in it if you beat it. And so I was unconsciously here giving you my recipe for pancakes. Now, what I do in the unleavened bread one is simply the whole egg goes straight into the batter and I don't separate them out. So let me go back and correct that. And then I mix and mix until it's smooth. And then I add a two teaspoon of vanilla flavoring. You'd be amazed what that does to it. And there again, I make sure that it's really thin because I want to pour it out of a little ladle. Can't even get it, in, you know, it'll drip all over the place with a spoon. I like an iron skillet. Any kind of a skillet you use, get it good and hot and test it with a drop of water, whatever. And then you either Grease it with maybe a vegetable oil, or if you want to use a little bit of butter, that's fine. But then you just pour, and I pick up that pan with a hot handle, with a hot, uh, you know, some kind of a napkin or something, a piece of cloth to protect my hand. And the minute I pour it in a little puddle right in the middle, about that big, I pick it up and, and all turning it around and let it spread until it's a thin little thing about that big around and not much thicker than two sheets of this paper doesn't take but moments for it to be in, as you can see, to, to turn brown. Turn it real quickly. It'll be a real dark brown on that side. And the next, the other side will never get quite as brown because they're going to be little tiny bubbles. You can't help that. Some air is trapped in there. Don't worry about that part. You're doing little crepes like crepe Suzettes or little thin pancakes. What I like to do, you can use any kind of thing you want to, peanut butter and jelly and roll them. Put that on there and roll them up. I'll make three per plate. I like to just make three of them and they're about, oh, maybe five inches long and, and uh, about as big around as your thumb or so. And then put a little bit of uh, syrup on them. You can put powdered sugar on them, anything you want. Great breakfast. I look forward to the days of unleavened bread because I get to make Norskas. I learned that from John Hill many years ago, by the way, and his mother passed it on to him, which is why I guess they call them Norskas because they were from Norway, his mother was, and they, they used that, that term for them. All right, enough of that, enough of my my uh, unleavened bread recipe. That's why I say we enjoy it. It isn't some kind of a burden. It isn't a yoke of bondage to have to eat unleavened bread instead of leavened bread and to avoid cheeseburgers and hamburgers, which are bad for you anyway in restaurants, and to avoid the white bread, which is bad for you and all of that, and to eat healthful things. That's why I said whole wheat stone ground. I think it's better for you. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 16, one to eight. Observe the month of Abib, all right, we observe it. Do I observe the new moon? You bet I do. I'll go out there and say, look, it's a new moon. I've observed that. But nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to have a religious service or a ceremony or a church service on the new moons. 
The new moons are not holy occasions. They were never designated as being holy time. He says, observe the month, Abib. You observe that because you go out and find out whether the barley is in the green ear. And so we do that. We observe it. And those who, of course, have been responsible for the calendar, and that was given into the Jews' hands, observe that year by year, and the calendar is calculated upon that. When is the month Abib? When does it begin? And over the decades and the centuries, models have been arrived at which will show you invariably when that will occur. For those who think that there's supposed to be someone going out into a field near Jerusalem and deciding when Abib is, wait just a minute. That was the function of the priesthood, and Jesus Christ absolutely eclipsed the priesthood. Christ is now the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We don't have a Levitical priesthood anymore. That is now the New Testament ministry, and the power is there to bind and to loose and to set the time for the annual holy days based upon the information we receive from those who deal with the calendar. Every year, someone some amateur theologian somewhere will decide, I think we're observing these days on the wrong date. And they will write something up. Well, they don't have any expertise. They don't have any background. And furthermore, they're not authorized. They are not a priest. And they're usually always not a minister. And they're certainly not the high priest. And it was his responsibility to go into the field and determine when was the month Abib. Now it's the responsibility of the church. Observe the month of Abib. And so we do. We look at the calendar, we say, the month of Abib is going to commence when? Well, then we look at it, and then the annual holy days are all dependent upon that. If that is the 15th day of the first month, then we can arrive at the 15th day of the seventh month for the Feast of Tabernacles and so on. And keep the Passover unto the eternal your God, for in the month of Abib the eternal your God brought you forth out of Egypt by night. And of course, if you look at Exodus 12, it was on the night time of the 15th or the beginning of the 15th. Notice the next two verses. You shall eat no unleavened, or no leavened bread with it, rather. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For you came forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day when you came forth out of the land of Egypt. You and I didn't come out of Egypt. We came out of Babylon. We came out of modern-day Egypt, which is Babylonish confusion, sun-worshipping people who are idolaters and don't even know it. And we came out of a world of false holidays which have eclipsed and replaced God's annual holy days so that modern generations don't even know their names. They will say the Feast of Water Nickels. They don't even know what you're talking about. They never heard the Feast of Tabernacles or the Days of Unleavened Bread. And uh, so don't bother trying to enlighten most people because you may as well be speaking Greek. There shall no leavened bread be seen with you in all your coast seven days, neither shall there anything of any flesh which you sacrifice the first day at even remain all night until the morning. Notice that at even then is before the night time, and the night time begins at 15th, and they sacrifice that at even before, and it doesn't say, of course, that they're supposed to sacrifice it on the 14th in the first place. Now, if you will turn to Matthew 16, verses 5 through 12, we all know that leaven is a type of sin. But notice this example of Christ. When his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. This was after the feeding of the four and the five thousand. Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because we have brought no bread? In other words, don't you know that if we were totally devoid of anything to eat that I could create it? They just had that experience a matter of hours before. Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I spoke, spake to you not concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? What is the leaven of a Pharisee? He goes on to say in verse 12, Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but the leaven or the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And it wasn't only doctrine, as we'll see a little later on. It was the egocentricity. It was the vanity. It was the fact that they were all puffed up with their own power and their own importance. 
They were abusers of the congregations. They were like little Hitlers who abused the congregations and who ripped off the flock, who fleeced the sheep, who kept them subdued and under and in terror lest they be put out. You read of the tremendous number of statements that Jesus made that a lot of people would think, well, that's some of the strongest language I've ever heard in Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of Gehenna? And time after time after time, he called them hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? Hypocrite is someone who postures one way, pretends to be something which he is not. He says, do this, but he won't do it. And that's what Christ laid upon them. He said, you will cause them to carry burdens. You won't lift with your little finger one of them. Why do you lay this upon God's people when you yourselves will not pick up the burdens that you're trying to put upon them? So when someone is teaching one thing, saying one thing, putting something upon the congregation and doing the opposite himself and not lifting the burden with even his little finger, not even touching it, then he's a Pharisee and a hypocrite. There's much more to that beside. We'll come to in due time. I want you to look now at the colliery verse to that over in Luke 12 and verse, let's go to Luke 11 and verse 38 and read up to that. Luke 11:38. when the Pharisee saw that Jesus hadn't washed, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner because they not only washed, but they went through a ceremonial washing as well. And the Lord said unto him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Holy Spirit inspired that. What's ravening? Well, you hear of a ravening wolf, like ravenous. Somebody says, I'm ravenous, I'm hungry. That is tremendous desire. It is lust. It isn't just anger. We think of a ravenous wolf, meaning raving. No, it also has to do with almost desperate hunger to get, to gather in, to take for yourself. Full of ravening and wickedness for evil purposes. They were evil people. They were wicked people. You fools did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also. But rather give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But you, well, woe unto you Pharisees, you tithe, mint, and rue, and all manner of herbs, little tiny spices, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done. Christ is not putting down tithing. He's saying you should have tithed. If you get an expensive herb, you get an expensive spice that you can use to season your food and, and make it more palatable, that is worth a lot of money. Back then, even salt was worth a lot of money. And so it was correct of them to tithe that to the priesthood in the temple. These ought you to have done. So Christ is upholding tithing and not to leave the other undone. That is judgment, mercy, and the love of God. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. I tried for years back in the old worldwide church to totally do away with a huge big ministerial section up in front. And I was unsuccessful. I tried hard. I, I practically begged my father to do that. And the other ministers were, well, we, we need this and we've got to be able to get in and out. And oh, we came all these reasons. I said, the only person you need up front is the duty elder, somebody that they're calling upon for anointing so they know where to come to find him. The rest of the ministers ought to be sitting around out there among their own congregations or among other people, just like the common lay people. They shouldn't be up here in front. They shouldn't have this great big section. But anyway, I tried says, Pharisees love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. They love to be recognized. And when you don't recognize them, it hurts their feelings. Hello, pastor. Oh, hello, big minister. How are you doing today? Love to, oh, look, Joe Pharisee. Hello, Joe. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. I mean, it's unbelievable. People just have to have that recognition. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. You don't even know. It looks like beautiful lawn. There's a dead corpse underneath there, or maybe a whitened sepulcher, as he called them. It looked like a beautiful little white building made out of marble or all painted and whitewashed, and inside it's full of dead men's bones, Christ said. Then answered one of the lawyers and said, Master, thus saying, you reproach us also, because they were part and parcel with the Pharisees. 
And he said, Woe unto you also, you lawyers. You ought to see, I could show it to you, my phone book is right over there, but in a city even of 100,000 people, there is probably a quarter of an inch thick series of dozens of pages of lawyers' ads in Tyler, Texas. And I see them on TV all the time. Did you ever work around asbestos? Maybe you have a cash settlement coming. Hint, hint. Uh, ambulance chasers, they call them in the United States. They, they want to uh, get there just in time to watch all the people as the bus careens around the corner, smacks into a tree. The driver runs away thinking that it's going to be bursting into flames at any moment. And all the neighborhood grabs, in, you know, runs onto the bus, grabs a seat and grabs their neck and starts screaming, oh, you've heard about it. The lawyers love that kind of thing. Were you in the bus? Oh, yeah, I was in the bus. No, they weren't. But anyway, some people do that. They're called ambulance chasers. And Jesus said something that really, really touches my heart. Because, uh, not talking about any specific, uh, there may be plenty of honest lawyers out there. There really might be, and I know there are. Matter of fact, I've met several of them. There are a couple of them that I deal with here in Tyler that I do respect, and I know they are good, decent people, and they're honest. I even have a nephew who is an honest lawyer. He really is. So I'm not taking issue with all lawyers, but these were the ones that Christ uh, took issue with. You laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and you yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers, I was referring to before. Woe unto you, you build the sepulchres of, of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly you bear witness that you allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their sepulchres. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets that was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias, this is a repeat of what you read in the last part of the 23rd chapter of Matthew, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Why? Not because he was laying on them the sins of yesteryear or past generation, but saying they were the same ilk. They were the same way. They had followed the same traditions. They were doing the same thing. Woe unto you lawyers, you've taken away the key of knowledge. They loved to keep the general laity ignorant. They didn't want to teach them letters. They didn't want them to be well read. They didn't want them to be literate. They wanted them to depend upon the lawyers for everything. And so today, of course, people have these specialists. People will say, well, who's your doctor? If you say, well, what do you mean? I don't have a doctor. You don't have a doctor? What? Who's your dentist? Well, I go to different ones. Well, you, you mean you don't have a single dentist? You don't have a single doctor that you go to? Well, I mean, that'd sound weird, wouldn't it, to most people? Well, who's your real estate agent? Who's your automobile dealer? Who is your lawyer? To whom do you go to do everything that you don't want to do for yourself? You, you're not able to go down and, and just buy a car. You don't want to look at an ad and deal with a person in the neighborhood from a classified ad or sell your own car. You got to go to a dealer. You got to go to a professional. And so these people continually thought they had to go to a professional. Woe unto you lawyers, you've taken away the key of knowledge, you entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and Pharisees began to urge him vehemently to provoke him to speak many things. They were accusing him, they were hurling one question after another from every conceivable angle, laying wait for him, seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. What were their motives? They weren't seeking truth. They didn't even seek to solve an argument or discuss an issue. They were deliberately trying to provoke him, hoping he would make a mistake. And if he did, they would nail him and take him off and kill him if they could. In the meantime, that's why I read up to it. When there were gathered together an innumerable company or multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another. Now, this is a mob where people are getting trampled. People are saying, ouch, stay off of my foot, you oaf. And some of them are falling down. They're trying to help them up because they're just trying to get as close to Christ as they can. He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware you of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Now, you know that a hypocrite is a very distasteful individual. 
And when you've got someone who is posturing and pretending to be something he is not, when I found out, for example, recently, just tell you one thing, doesn't meet her, I don't need to give you any names, I won't even tell you what part of the country, but there was a young man who aspired to be a minister and he was so righteous. I mean, righteousness, he was just like baked on righteousness, like baked on enamel. I mean, he had in, in high gloss righteousness. There was righteousness in his demeanor, in his necktie, in the way he walked. I mean, he was righteous. You knew that the door probably said, Mr. Righteous. Kind of a person you knew was what I'd call in the Navy a minister striker. You know, you were a boilerman striker or you were whatever, meaning that you had a little bitty designation on your sleeve that said that next time you got a promotion, you would be a petty officer, maybe like a bosun or a machinist mate or something. Well, you knew that this man was a minister striker. And he was hypercritical of everybody, and especially he was hypercritical of me. Oh, was he contemptuous of me. He hated me, and he hated my sons. He didn't like us very well at all. Well, he ran off here a few months ago and got married, found out. Now, why am I shaking my head and not rejoicing? Well, because he married a doctor. But... He married a male doctor. <laughs> and I, I guess you should say they lived happily there ever after. Uh, well, it, it shows you, doesn't it? I mean, there are just times that you shake your head and you wonder, how in the world can people pull themselves up by their own great posturing bootstraps and claim to be Mr. Righteous, and then you find out all the time the guy was a homosexual? that he was absolutely one of these, they say in Australia, I, was just, I remembered uh, when one of our Australian students told me that word, and I hadn't heard that word until that very moment. They call them pooftas, a poofta. So for you people in Australia, the guy proved that he was a poofta, came out of the closet. Uh, anyway, all right, having said that, hypocrisy is, is disgusting. And that's why he said, there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known, because sometimes the true colors come out, don't they? Some men's sins go before, some men they follow after. So eventually, what goes around comes around. Leaven is insidious. You know that there is leavening right now on your nose? Yes, there are yeast spores floating around in the room and outside, all over the place, and they're microscopic. They're tiny little yeast spores. So housewives know that they could mix dough, like I was talking about, and instead of leaving it unleavened and baking it immediately, if they just put it on a shelf outside, maybe screen it so the flies don't get on it, or maybe pull in from the trees, but anyway, outside, and they used to have those kinds of cupboards in old, sto in old uh, homes when I was a boy, my grandmother did, she had a cooler that opened to the outside, and at night, she would actually put butter and things like that in a little alcove with a sliding door, and there was just screen outside. Animals and cats and things couldn't get at it. Birds couldn't get at it. But it was a cooler, and it was sitting in the outside air. Well, they would put a lump of dough out there, and overnight, it would gradually become leaven. They would leave that dough for two or three days, and that leaven was insidious. It was also invisible. Couldn't even see it. Little by little, it was working and those little buds and spores were just doubling and quadrupling and, and dividing all the time. And eventually, when she cooked the bread, it would rise because all those little spores had just gone riot, and they loved that environment. Yeast spores love a loaf of bread. Now, if you and I are a loaf of bread, and if leaven is sin, like a yeast spore, sometimes it is so insidious, it's virtually invisible. And it gets in there almost before you know it. And little by little, the entire lump is leavened. And people don't even know that it's there oftentimes until, as it say, it's a hot, hot time in the old town tonight, until real trouble comes and like, say, being tried by fire. And then, of course, the leaven appears for what it is. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. I want to read through a few things with you and read up to the fifth chapter. Here the Apostle Paul is saying that he was being criticized and judged by the laity. He said, with me it's a very small thing, chapter 4, verse 3, that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment because they were criticizing, condemning. Here was a very proud church. You know, you've read 1 Corinthians many times. They were getting drunk at a Passover. They were tolerating incest where a man was living with his own stepmother. 
They were people, though, and that's hard for me to understand, but there it is in the Bible, so I understand it, that had spiritual gifts, some of which we don't even have in the church today. And yet there were, they were Gentiles, and they were filled with emotion. They had a lot of, of emotion, and they were Italians, as we would call them today. And they were critical of the Apostle Paul. He said, I know nothing by myself, yet I'm not justified hereby. Verse 4 of chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, He that judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. He said, In these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself unto Apollos for your sake, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Now, how did the book start out? I am of Paul, I am of Kephas, I am of Paulus, I am of Christ. Each one of you saying, I'm of somebody else. Thank God, he said, I didn't baptize any of you, save maybe one or two. And the Apostle Paul was saying, who am I and who is Apollos, but those who have planted. But he said, the foundation that is laid is none other but Jesus Christ, and let him that builds thereupon take heed how he builds. And he said, you shouldn't be followers of men. Follow me as I follow Christ, he said. And obviously the inference is anytime they found the Apostle Paul wasn't following Christ, then don't follow him. But as long as he was following Christ, Paul was bold enough to say, follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. So he's saying, don't think of men above that which is written. People are always looking for a human leader to follow. Who are you with? What group are you with? What leader do you want to be under? They are not able to stand on their own two feet and to use their own spiritual sovereignty and their own decision-making capacity to decide what is right according to the Word of God that they themselves can see with their own two eyes. They've got to feel like they belong somewhere. Well, I guess that's good. It's even good for me in a way because there are people that feel that they belong to the GTAEA or the Intercontinental Church of God, but I hope those are people who belong to God the Father and Jesus Christ wholly and totally, and that they are using the Word of God in the same way that I urge them to do so. Follow me only as I follow Jesus Christ. Anytime I get off that beaten path, anytime I get off the track, the narrow road really of following Christ, don't follow me. Find somebody else that is following Jesus Christ. In the meantime, if you are following Christ and I am following Christ, we're going to look around and find out we're both going along together and we're going along on the same road. Now, the reason he brings this up, not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Aha, here we are. We get to the real kernel of the meaning of the Days of Unleavened Bread that has to do with vanity and ego and jealousy and contentions and division, and he's talking about the church. He is now writing to a congregation and saying, puffed up one for or against another. Have you ever seen groups here and there around the world, and th this has happened in several places in the United States, it has happened in other countries, where people just get irked and irritated with each other. They, they, they don't like one another. Now, let's just face it. Let's just face it. When you and I were called of God, and all the other brethren who are called of God have been called from every conceivable race, we have blacks, we have Orientals, we have Eastern Europeans, we have Slavs, we have British, we have Chicanos, as they say, or Latinos, and Mexican Americans, and so on, African Americans, but we've got people in other countries that are members of God's church. People write me regularly. I get letters from places like India and in West and, and South Africa and so on, and nations like Ghana. And these are black people, and they know the truth of God. There are many of them that used to be in the old worldwide church many years ago that are floundering around wondering where to go and where is the truth being taught. So my point is that not only are we of different nations, not only are we of different races, but we are of different cultural backgrounds and we are different heights, weights, shapes, sizes, and therefore we are of different tastes. We are of different personalities. We have different methods of viewing the same issues. We have different methods of, of choice. So I'm saying that the church, which has the commonality of trust in God the Father and Jesus Christ, the commonality of having been baptized and being baptized members and receiving God's Holy Spirit, are not the kind of people 
who might just naturally coalesce together. You and I know that in your experience in life, whether you go back to as a toddler in your first experience in school, or the cliques that formed in middle and high school, or the cliques that formed in college, or the cliques if you were in the military, and there were cliques in the military when I was aboard ship, Different groups of guys would sort of be, decide who they liked, who they wanted to go on liberty with, go ashore with, who they liked to be around, and others they didn't like, and they shunned them and avoided them. Isn't that the way of it? It is absolutely human nature. Well, what happens in the church is that people begin to get these glasses that they learn to put on through which they judge and they view the actions of other people. And because they feel betrayed by the, will, the world and they come into the church of God, they begin to judge themselves according to what Christ said, be ye therefore perfect as my Father which is in heaven is perfect. They demand perfection in other people. They want them to be perfect too. So they look at them very critically. And if they see some little thing they don't like, they get irked and irritated. The Apostle Paul in the book to Corinth, the first letter to the Corinthians, talked about the fact that the idol is nothing, for example, because people were judging one another about eating meat that had been sacrificed out there in the shanties, or the shambles as they were called, before some leering idol. Well, I don't care whether you've got a thousand idols leering at you made out of stone and wood. You can take a little goat or a sheep or a calf out there and cut its throat and dress it out and take it home, and that piece of stone leering at you didn't have any power to taint that meat. And so Paul was saying the idol is nothing. But people couldn't get that through their thick heads. They just could not believe that an idol is nothing. Recently a man asked me about some kind of a cross or something, and I've seen people who will actually refuse to go into a meeting place that we had to rent because there was a Christmas tree there or because there was a cross on the wall. That cross isn't, I mean, I want to be real careful about whether or not the cross had just the patibulum on the top and an upright pail, and I'm pretty convinced that, that is true looking at Bullinger's Companion Bible, but look, we don't need to bring persecution on the church of God by calling overtly, and every time we get the chance, the cross a pagan symbol. I mean, here is Billy Graham saying, come to the cross, as you know. And there are crosses on every church and Catholic as well as Protestant. And if, if people act that way, I mean, you're going to bring persecution on yourself by doing that. There are some people that just will not even attend a place where there's a cross present. Well, the same thing applies in 1 Corinthians 14 and elsewhere in the book of Romans as well, where the Apostle Paul was talking about that and talking about idols and circumcision and the like. So let's learn that lesson, that an idol or some symbol like that has no power to hurt you in any manner, shape, or form. Now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, and skip along a little ahead of that to come to verse 18, because he said, now some are puffed up. Look at this language. He said in verse 6, you are puffed up one against another. Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you, as though he would be an absentee landlord. He wouldn't show up and try to straighten things out. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. Why is he leading up to this subject of being puffed up? Look at chapter 5. It is commonly reported that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, even in that society that was illegitimate and illegal and not allowed, that one should have his father's wife, a case of incest. And most of the commentaries think, since it says his father's wife and doesn't say his mother, that it must mean that his mother had died and that the father had been widowed and married another lady who is now his stepmother. And so I think that's obvious and natural, and I don't disagree with that interpretation by the commentaries at all. And you, that is the congregation, along with the local leadership, are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. He goes on to talk about how a little leaven leavens the entire lump, or as we say, one rotten apple spoils the entire box. After he told them to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, he said in verse 6, your glorying, your boasting, your ego, your vanity, your jealousy, your party spirit, saying, I'm of this man, I'm of the other man, and putting down people of a different party, a different group. Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
Think of it this way. I go on television into a given city, and eventually people will come along as a result of the telecast, and they will maybe tap into the website, or they will call us here in Tyler, and they will say, where is the closest church or hosted fellowship group to me? But what has been their experience up to that moment? They might have been a Methodist, a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Church of Christ, Episcopalian, Anglican, whatever. And what was their experience, maybe even only a few weeks or a few months, or maybe just the preceding Sunday? Why, they went into a beautiful place, maybe even a big cathedral. They went into a large church building with big stained glass windows and a huge organ. There were deacons there dressed up in their best clothing. The minister was there. It was all very formal. There were nice big thick hymnals there. There were little envelopes that probably had 1 Corinthians 16, 2 on it or something. There was a song service. There was someone that did a scripture reading. They probably recited the Lord's Prayer together. And then there was a short little sermon. And that was the environment, that was the, you know, venue that they went to. And they were accustomed to people being in a worshipful attitude, dressing up in very nice and suitable clothing. Now let's say that they call and they find out where the nearest church is, and they find out it's meeting in a rented hall. That's the first shock. The second shock is they go there if they find out that it's not a very nice looking hall and it's in a bad neighborhood. That's real cultural shock. Then if they go into the place and they find out that half of the people are in there in their short sleeve shirts or maybe wearing an old plaid shirt with a jacket on it or something else and most of them the men don't even have ties and the women are wearing anything they wish, that's a real shock. Then, if they have some well-intentioned dragon that comes trotting up to them, male or female, with his or her latest doctrinal idea, or with a lot of gossip, that's another shock. But if they come in and they find out that it's a divided church, that there are people who are lobbying to get their friends to be against Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so over here, or maybe there's a lady and she, she's talking a lot, and she says, well, I don't know, I was mistreated by the minister. And she just can't get a big enough audience to just give her spiel to and tell them how bad she'd been treated. Don't think it hasn't happened. Don't think we haven't had people. And that is a tragedy. And I'm telling you, the people who are responsible for that, Jesus Christ himself said it would be better for them if they had a big old heavy stone millstone tied to their neck and they were just dumped off a boat in the depths of the sea and drowned on the way down. Because he said, if you offend one of these little ones, woe be unto you, it would be better for you if you had a millstone around your neck and cast it into the sea than to offend one of these little ones who believe in me. So the responsibility of every one of our hosts and every one of our local churches, whether chartered or not, chartered or unchartered, doesn't matter is to provide the kind of an atmosphere as much as they possibly can physically. I know that's not always possible. Sometimes you've got to meet in a motel meeting room, and sometimes it's not in the greatest neighborhood so that you can afford it. I understand that. I've met in all kinds of places. We've met in all kinds of places here in Tyler that were very poor. And in a couple of cases, I think they even saw a mouse running across the floor, and we left that place because people were putting their children down on a blanket on the floor. So I understand all of that. But woe be unto the individuals who do not do all they possibly can to make it a cohesive, loving, warm, friendly, open arms church and to invite those people in to what will be a very wonderful experience for them instead of a very bad experience. Because you all know, no matter who you are and where you are, we've had people show up once or twice or three times and then go their way and not come back. And I know that sometimes they may take issue with what I say. So I know that I have my own part in that. And sometimes I've preached and, and I've said words or I've used a phrase. Maybe some people in Australia, forgive me, don't like the word poofta. Uh, they don't like the word queer here in the United States, which is why I've used it sometimes. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, I, I know that I've had my part in that. Maybe I've hurt some feelings along the way. And I always pray to God not to let that happen when I'm in a personal appearance campaign. And even in the closing prayer, ask that what I have said doesn't get between you, Father in heaven, and these people. But we need to know that there needs to be no leaven, not only in us personally, but no leaven, insidious, unseen, working its way through a congregation.
We need to know all of that. Now let's go on with this, because this is God's Word about the days of unleavened bread. Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. What's he talking about? He's talking about the whole congregation and about every individual in it. He's saying to now give you the exact meaning in, in English language and modern terms, purge out sin that you can be sinless as you are unleavened, meaning purge out the spiritual leaven, purge out sin in the same way that you are now physically unleavened. The only way you can understand that verse. Otherwise, you've got a direct contradiction right there within only a few words, and Paul is contradicting himself, and that doesn't happen in the Word of God. He is saying, purge out the old leaven, meaning spiritually, even as you are unleavened. This was written at such a time that it could be read and could be dealt with by the leadership in Corinth during the days of unleavened bread. And it's obvious here, I know, do you know that there are people in the Protestant churches and even some of the seven-day Sabbatarians who reject the annual holy days, but they do observe the seven-day Sabbath. And they will reject this because it says, yes, but it says, well, keep this with the unleavened bread of sincerity of truth. So we keep it by being sincere and truthful. But it says you shall eat unleavened bread seven days. And Jesus Christ kept it. And the apostles kept it. Paul said, I must by all, by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Luke wrote in Acts 27, 9, when the sailing was rough now because the fast day of atonement was passed. So we know there are plenty of indications in the New Testament that the apostles kept the annual holy days of God. And this is a very strong one right here. Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, even as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now get that and never forget it. We observe the Lord's Supper today. We do not observe the Passover. We erroneously have called it that, and I'm trying to gradually get people used to changing over and calling it the Lord's Supper, because it actually was a New Testament observance, as I've explained in the tape that you probably saw, 17 to 24 hours prior to the actual slaying of the lamb and the eating of the, eating of the Paschal Supper of the Jews on the 15th. And this was Christ's Passover supper, not long after sunset, at the beginning of the night of the 14th, not the end of it, which is when the Jews began to slay the lamb, so that Christ was slain and that he died on that stake at the very moment that the high priest slit the throat of the first sacrificial lamb. It is a beautiful, unavoidable type there, type that you can see in the Word of God. And I think Bullinger's appendices and the articles that he have on, has on that in his Bible, the uh, companion Bible, are extremely instructive. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He is our Passover. We do not observe the Passover. We accept his sacrifice. We do not kill lambs and roast their flesh. We don't eat with our shoes on and our staff in our hand. We're not going to flee and leave our homes. But we do observe the Lord's Supper, as he says in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and we go through that at the Passover evening, of course, or the, the Lord's Supper evening. Therefore, let us, and he's talking to Gentile Christians, keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, because that's what they had going on in that congregation, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Is there any malice in your congregation? Is there any wickedness? Do you think there is any leaven? Well, let me tell you right now, as you sit there, you probably have already unleavened your home. You've unleavened maybe even your car. You have vacuumed around the nooks and crannies. Many housewives do that. And a lot of times we've preached about how, oh, they find where the kids let a cracker or a cookie slip down beneath, you know, the divan or somewhere. And they're here they thought their home was unleavened and they feel so bad about it. Don't feel bad. Do the best you possibly can. Try to look everywhere. Get rid of the leaven. But the lesson we've always then passed on to the church when someone discovers something like that is, yes, you see, it's the same when we start looking deeply inside ourselves. We find some hidden leaven we didn't know was there. So when I tell you that even now there are yeast spores perched on your nose because they've been in the air, it merely serves to illustrate that point. What the Apostle Paul was dealing with was human nature, and in this church, 
It was the very same type of thing we deal with in God's true church today. Frequently, brethren, cliques, groups get angry with each other. An individual, and then that individual may go to other people and try to get sympathy and elicit support, gets angry at the minister or vice versa. The minister decides to get angry at someone. I don't know, but people do not, it seems, just constantly look at 1 Corinthians 13 and look at Galatians 5, the last part of that chapter, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Now, I've called unleavened bread humble pie, flat bread. Go ahead and try that recipe I gave you. You'll enjoy that. But when you do eat unleavened bread, remember, I didn't even go through all of John uh, 6, 7, and 8 and uh, where Jesus Christ said, I am the bread of God that came down from heaven because I did that last year. And when you eat bread, what happens to it? Christ said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. If any man eat of me, shall never die, but shall have eternal life. When you eat bread, if you eat those flat little crepes or pancakes, they become a part of you. They're carried by the little platelets to every part of your body, from your finger trips to the, to the follicles of your hair. And what you eat, you assimilate. You digest. It becomes a part of you, and it helps give you life. And so eat unleavened bread seven days and rejoice in the deep meaning of it that not only are we to put sin out, but we are to take Christ and his wonderful spirit of love, joy, and peace, of esteeming the other better than ourselves, of having gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith against which there is no law, of loving one another, of being extremely tolerant, not easily provoked, always believing the best, hoping for the best, hoping for the most salubrious outcome, and looking upon the positive side of everything. The Days of Unleavened Bread I always really welcome, not only because I love to make Norskas for my family, but because of the deep meaning of it. And God willing, we will be speaking to the brethren up in Seattle on the last day of Unleavened Bread. And perhaps in the coming Sabbath, we can also uh, get a videotape. Mark is standing behind the camera right now, and we're about to conclude this one of uh, the sermon on the Sabbath, and you can play that when those of you overseas and in other countries and scattered around the country where you have a small hosted fellowship group of only three, four, five people, and you can perhaps play that one on the last day of Unleavened Bread, uh, because of course we can't get it to you, and we'll videotape the one on the last day of Unleavened Bread up in Seattle and probably send you that one for next year. So I hope you have a wonderful Days of Unleavened Bread wherever you are, we love all of you. We thank you so very much for your support, and especially thanks to all of you who have helped us with a building project recently. We've had some wonderful responses to that, and it went from 2,000 to 18,000 within about oh, four months. And of course, having paid out 101,000 for the property already, and having the loan, getting started on the building, we are very, very thankful that finally we're going to have a headquarters facility and a place for the Tyler Church to meet and for regional seminars, regional holy days, and maybe even an auxiliary feast site at the new facility when it's finished. I'll keep you in touch via the bulletin and the newspaper and letters that I'll be sending out. I hope you have a wonderful Days of Unleavened Bread. God bless you all and goodbye. <laughs>